Hi, uh, my name is Nye. I'm the chair of ITGM, and this is uh, not me. This is not SCAD, this is me. This is a hypothesis that I have and a lot of sort of the crux of my research, which is that um, I think the game economic models are changing. People have this sort of mentality in their head about what game business models are, and I think that it's gonna be really hard for us to predict what those business models are. So I thought I would put this down into a presentation. This is Disruptions in Gaming the rapid acceleration of technology and the effects on game network economics. Again, this is a guess and this is me. This is not, this is not SCAD. So a lot of this is predicated on the fact that um, the technology landscape is changing extremely rapidly. So this is um, Andreessen Horowitz. This is a uh, research, uh, this is a venture capital firm, I'm sorry, that uh, focuses on technology. Uh, Mark Andreessen from Netscape fame uh, and a lot of the investments on a lot of major Silicon Valley um, type uh, shops. So you can see that uh, machine learning and AI papers, archive papers, which is the uh, publishing research from you know research institutions, is going on an exponential scale, which means we're getting a lot of AI developments very, very rapidly. Uh, at the same time as we're getting these AI um, developments, we're also seeing the cost for computing uh, drop dramatically and the ability to store data rise dramatically. Uh, the amount of data that we're creating on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is far outweighing the, the amount that we created even 10 years ago. So it's a really interesting time digitally uh, to be considering some of these ideas. So today we're going to talk a little bit about me, and then we're going to talk about the traditional game business model because people will sort of gravitate to this idea that I pay money and I get a game from it. Uh, I'll talk really quick about the network and then what it means for a network game system model specifically for AAA network games and then user-generated content, and then why I think there's a disruption that's coming, powered by AI and the like. We're going to talk a little bit about AI and then what the definition is, the future of work, and then why the landscape is in flux. And at the end, I'll leave you some parting words, basically, for some advice. So my name is Nye. Uh, I'm a creative technologist. I'm an animator, artist, uh, and currently the chair of ITGM. Um, but I, you know, it's all predicated on my love of building video games and animating characters and doing all that kind of stuff. So um, this is a little bit of a snapshot of my background. Uh, everything can be sort of predicated to, based on Lego. I went to University of Pennsylvania, undergraduate, and then I worked in the industry on Celebrity Deathmatch. I made some short films on my own. I was an animator on Monster House. I worked for Disney Imagineering for a while. And then I did movies like Battleship and Oblivion. And then at the end of uh, my sort of entertainment career, I got really interested in machine learning, particularly as it applies to motion capture in animation and the like. And that was before I came to SCAD, and I've been to SCAD now for almost five years. So uh, ITGM makes games. These are some of the games from the last year, Sky Strider, Beneath the Badlands, and Shadowed Legacy. If you want to know more, come visit us at ITGM. Uh, we'd love to see you. So let's talk a little bit about the traditional game industry. This is sort of what most people think happens in the game industry is that on the left hand side of the screen you see a company that has a uh, amount of capital that has been invested in it. So this company uh, has a group of people who work on it. They produce a product like um, you know Halo 2 here which is on a um, you know a piece of media like a hard disk or perhaps it's a downloadable content and then people buy it uh, in order to play it to which they give money that goes back to the original company in this case Microsoft or 343. So this is kind of how we all expect that the gaming industry works. And while this worked for a while, this is, this is what's being massively disrupted um, right now. One of the things to keep in mind about this traditional game industry is that there still is an intellectual property license that runs along underneath this. That is to say that despite the fact that you might buy a copy of Halo 2, uh, and play it and have it, you know, even as a hard media and put it up on your shelf. Um, the intellectual property license still belongs to Microsoft. Uh, and that's important to understand that the content, the idea of the content, still belongs to the company despite the fact that you've purchased the ability to own it. Uh, then along comes something called networks. Now, networks are uh, sort of groups, you might think of it as sort of like a social network, a group of people that you know or uh, a network of you know, cars or a network of trucks. Uh, it's essentially nodes and then the connections between those nodes. And this is very interesting because you can shape networks in any sort of organizational capacity. 
Uh, very often we think of networks as you know Facebook with um, sort of a centralized actor distributing a piece of software to a bunch of users. But networks can be in any sort of shape or form and there's a lot of different forms here. Uh, and it's important to know that they're very malleable and fluid and they can be controlled by the users who operate within them. The AAA networked game industry is predicated on centralized servers, right? So that company, the Microsoft or the, the Bungie or um, all, you know, Valve, they have their own hardware to be able to serve the multiplayer capacity to their users. So not only does the company scale the content, they also scale the server capacities to be able to host the game, right? And so this means that players not only buy a, a piece of media, say like a $60 Assassin's Creed or, or Red Dead Redemption or something, they can also have access to the multiplayer that comes with it, right? And so the money still comes back to uh, the, the original producer of the content. Um, but there's sort of an added uh, component here that users tend to create their own content to then add to the game itself. This is called user-generated content. Right? One of the examples you might think about is Minecraft. Right? A lot of people can build their own content, not only within Minecraft, but also they can mod the content itself. Right? And so this kind of mindset of being able to create a platform that people play and purchase their way in, but then also can monetize their own creations within it. Um, again, in this economy, uh, this allows the intellectual property rights to, to be maintained by the company that creates the content. So, for example, Epic Games creates Fortnite, and uh, Epic hosts Fortnite on its servers and then distributes it to people for free, but the way that they make money is that people can play or, or add mods or change content or, or the like, they still have to pay a royalty fee or a use fee, a 30% fee back to Epic. And this is where all the money from Fortnite is going and that's what allows them to sustain the Unreal Engine and a lot of the different um, things that they have going on because they have these billions of dollars that come from the tax that they, they, they get from allowing people to build and mod uh, and produce content for Fortnite. So, this is all well and good, uh, but there are some things on the horizon that are happening that um, could disrupt this model. So one of them that I find is interesting is open source, right? So these are uh, softwares that actually don't have licenses that require intellectual property or fees, licensing fees go to go back to their original owners, right? So for example, Blender, Blender is a free and open source uh, 3D package that allows animation and rendering and all kinds of stuff that um, can outperform packages like Autodesk Maya. So you can buy a license for Autodesk or you can get a free version of Blender uh, and be able to, to use it, right? Same with Python or Android, your, your phone, your Android phone is, is run by an operating system that's open source. And instead of like um, Unreal Engine, which is even might be free, it's still licensed by Epic, the Godot engine is completely free and open source, which means that um, people can take it and do anything they want with it, and they don't, they don't own any you know, responsibility or licensing or royalties back to the original creators. Similarly, uh, cryptocurrency networks are trying to find new forms of economic systems within these network capacities. So you might have heard of uh, Ethereum or the Bored Apes or something along those lines where NFT collections, um, instead of thinking of them as just sort of like cryptographically secure collectibles, you might think of these as economies, like right? transaction economies, transactional economies, where um, there are what are called DPIN, uh, you know, these structural networks like Wi-Fi networks, storage networks, processing power networks that are all uh, predicated on the exchange of things like Filecoin or Ethereum. Uh, the Helium network, for example, allows you to mine Helium but also provide Wi-Fi um, for uh, people who host. So it's basically the tokenization of assets uh, and it's, it's, it's producing sort of these new economic systems. The last component of disruption is that hardware 
is getting increasingly cheaper, right? I, I, my first slide that I showed showed that there was an awful lot of, um, uh, you know, rapid development in, in hardware and also storage capacity and Wi-Fi and the like, um, 3D printing, uh, Arduinos, um, you know, Raspberry Pis. There's a, a lot of low cost software and as a result, maker spaces and the like give you um, an opportunity to create more hardware-based infrastructure. The problems with this is, is that open source does not have a business model. So open source projects are, are kind of unwieldy. Uh, it's sort of more like a, an overgrown garden than a sort of a well-tended garden. Uh, similarly, peer-to-peer -peer networks have rampant crime. There's all kinds of what are called rug pulls on even the NFT um, things. There's scams, it's all over the place. It's very early, uh, despite the fact that, that some of these networks are pretty robust and have a lot of um, structural power. Um, sorry, uh, there are many of these networks that don't quite um, work to their full capacity yet. And then also, uh, most of the low cost hardware, despite the cost savings you can have for independent entrepreneurs or independent maker spaces, most of them are, are pretty much just hobbyists, glorified hobbyists. And utilizing these in production or high, high caliber development is still uh, somewhat early. So one of the things that is happening though is all of these three disruptions are being empowered by artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence goes beyond just GPT, chat GPT, or these image-based models, or these you know, um, video-based models that you might have seen. The, the ability for, for AI to rapidly uh, create productivity gains within people and, um, uh, and learn and, and develop things rapidly is, is increasing. So in order to understand AI, you should understand three components. One is architecture. One are data sets and one are compute, right? So the architecture are something beyond any of us, right? You need to be sort of a PhD, um, you know, from Stanford to understand how these mathematical architectures work. But the data sets, it's, it's interest, like we can understand what data is, right? Anytime you produce a digital artifact of some sort, it's data that can be used to help train AI. And then there's massive, massive amounts of compute, which is why right now, you know, companies like um, OpenAI and, uh, and Facebook and NVIDIA and the like have the tactical advantage because they have the ability to afford the processing power to be able to um, uh, forge the, these, these massive um, models. So uh, what's gonna happen is that these, these three components, architecture, data sets, and compute, are going to become localized and agenic. Essentially, that means that we're going to be able to run localized AI on our own computer as opposed to having to depend on the high-end uh, AI from OpenAI and the like, which means that every car that we have, every computer that we have, every um, uh, mobile phone that we have will allow us to have AI in some capacity. So the way that I might want to think about this is like Iron Man has a part, uh, sort of a, a, an automated um, sidekick Jar Jarvis, which does things, automated things for him. Uh, and we're all going to have our own um, agents to be able to do things. So you're going to be able to, you know, in empower your AI agent to um, organize some files or to some paint some textures or to generate some things, automate your marketing, things like that. That's all going to start to happen. So as that ha starts to happen, there's this like this debate amongst the many network people that work is going to migrate from a very centralized, expensive, capitally intensive uh, process where you need large amounts of money and people and infrastructure. Uh, and the way that they defend that is by owning all of the intellectual property. Uh, and it's gonna migrate into sort of these decentralized network-based economies where people are going to control their own low-cost AI share their resources, um, you know, sustainable resources. And the way to incentivize people to join these networks is to give them a, a, a piece of the action, essentially, by fractionizing, fractional IP licensing and doing tokenomics of their assets, right? So this is the hypothesis that I, I tend to work off of, and I think that this is why the game industry 
is going to be rapidly, has the potential to be rapidly disrupted by decentralized networks because decentralized networks can then democratize the ability for anybody to contribute as opposed to a set of small number of actors. Uh, this is already happening right now, right? So not only is uh, Roblox or Fortnite um, increasing, like basing their entire business model on having other people mod their e ecosystem, there is um, a boom in AI and Web3 gaming that is happening in a number of startups right now. And they're all predicated on this idea that we're going to have, we're going to be able to democratize the labor and the intellectual property ownership amongst the network participants as opposed to a single centralized um, actor. So we're moving into this very, very disruptive migration period. So my guess is that there will be far less corporate stable jobs, but there will be a lot of opportunity in these emergent technologies and networks. So instead of trying to put all of your eggs in one basket and going into Epic or Microsoft, you should look at a lot of these emergent technologies. If there is a startup, an AI startup, that has a tool that allows video generation or something, or there's a Web3 startup uh, or, or network, democratized network that is, you know, you know, giving out assets or doing some sort of thing, you should look at these as opportunities to be able to participate, not only gain skills, but potentially make revenue. Uh, you should learn and understand IP and licensing because not only is that important for you as a game developer to understand what you do and don't own, but also like when you generate your own IP, your own ideas, characters, stories, games, you should understand how that's going to be used as well. You should find ways to participate in network economies, markets, production, and distribution, right? They're all over the place, right? So there's markets, right? The Unreal uh, Asset Store, for example, you can provide your own assets, but also in the blockchain economies, there's a number of markets. Production, where are you going to be building these things? Am I going to you know, use Blender, for example? Are there Blender communities that are building animation tool sets or things like that? Or dis distribution, there are content networks that are trying to find content that you can provide your content and potentially get a kickback for their distribution, right, by licensing it. They're everywhere, you can find them on Discord, Slack, go to conventions, go to social media, they're all out there. It's a matter of up to you to find them. So you should experiment and understand AI and Web3 as it applies to your skills. So if you're a modeler, you should understand that AI is going to be disrupting large portions of your moment to moment, but still the skill of that we're going to need modeled assets are probably going to exist. And then also like Web3, like should I take my models and put them on a blockchain? Should it be Solana or Ethereum or Tezos or something like that, right? So how does it apply to your specific creative skill set? You should learn how to protect yourself and your data because privacy and localization will be super important. And I think this all ties back into the fact that we're gonna control our own AI and our own data sets locally um, because not only do we wanna protect our data, we also wanna protect our IP and our own um, ability to monetize our value. And then just kind of be adaptable and agile because it's gonna get really, really weird. Uh, I can't possibly predict what's going to happen, but it's gonna get nuts. So go out and make it happen. Uh, I believe in all of you. I think this is a really wild and crazy time and I hope we all find the best in it. If you have any questions, please reach out. Uh, again, my name is Nye uh, and that's my email there at the bottom. Thanks so much for your time.